So we're busy with our journey through the book of Ephesians, and what a wonderful book that we are studying. Now, why are we studying Ephesians? Well, let me explain. Think of this illustration. It would be very sad and very embarrassing if a grown-up person were to behave in a childish manner. In other words, uh, if they had no control over their emotional responses, or if they behaved in a certain manner in public, which is not expected of a, an adult. Uh, typically, we would say of someone like that, oh, please grow up. Uh, the, the plan with birth is that we would grow from infancy to maturity, that we would become mature people. Likewise, being a child of God, a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Christ, implies that you and I grow from a state of spiritual infancy to maturity, where we are actually grown up in the Lord. Now, this is the aim of our series, is to nurture maturity in all of us. This is the aim of the Christian walk. Paul puts it like this in Ephesians 4, verse uh, 14 and 15. The, the NIV puts it like this. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And so God's plan for each and every child that belongs to him is that we would grow from spiritual infancy to maturity. The letter that Paul writes to the Ephesians gives a wonderful, full-bodied, complete picture of two things. First of all, the picture of who we are in Christ. Uh, we could say our identity. And then secondly, how we are to live or behave in Christ, our activity. And we must all, always remember the importance that our identity, who we are, should precede our activity, what we do. I want to invite you to really be, be part of this journey. It's a six-week journey uh, that this series will, will stretch over. And we're going to have 12 sermons during these six weeks. Uh, one that you would be able to find online in the mornings and then in the afternoons, another one. Also, something that will be of uh, benefit to you is our 30-day journal on the book of Ephesians, which you can download in PDF form on our website. So in the scripture that we read this morning, uh, we see this shocking statement that Paul makes. He says that you and I, when we are born, we are born spiritually dead. You see, because of our relation to Adam, because of the consequences of sin, we are born spiritually dead. And so Paul starts off by describing the outward uh, evidence of this deadness when he says that we were all dead in our trespasses. He says we once walked in this way. He says uh, once we all lived out the passions of our flesh, you and I were born spiritually dead. Today we're going to talk about the wonderful truth that in Jesus Christ we are recreated. We're a recreated people. But first of all, it's important for us to understand where we come from. The fact that we are born without God, that we are born spiritually Dead. And you and I need to own up to this fact. We need to take responsibility individually for this fact. You can't blame God and say, well, this is just the way that God created me. Or you can't say, well, I'm going to lay all the blame in front of Adam's feet uh, because he sinned. No, the fact is that you and I, by birth, are far from God. You and I would have acted the same had we been in the garden of Eden and not Adam. You see, the word very clearly pictures for us the dilemma that we find ourselves in, you and I personally, individually. Paul words this in the book of Romans, the third chapter from verse 10. He says, none is righteous, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive uh, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness, bitterness. Verse 17, the way of peace they have not known. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This sounds like a terrible, terrible, hopeless situation. But the wonderful news is that you and I don't have to remain at this place of being spiritually 
dead without hope in the world because our first main point today is this wonderful turning point, these two words, but God. But God is, is two of the, is the most wonderful uh, phrase in the Bible because it says something of where we came from and then God came and he intervened. I'm sure where you are today, you are able to testify about times in your life where things have been going in a certain direction. Perhaps your marriage or your business or your health or some relationship had been going uh, in a negative spiral. And then God came and you were able to say, I was headed in a certain direction, but God. God came and God made a change and a difference to my life. There are four very important markers when we look at the but God uh, aspect of uh, the gospel that we see in this chapter that Paul writes to the Ephesians. The first one is that only God's goodness brings about change. Isn't that so wonderful to know that, that God in his goodness, in his mercy, in who he is comes and only he can bring about change. And that is why Paul can say in verse 4, but God. Secondly, God saved us while we were still dead in trespasses. Verse 5 tells us about that. Uh, thirdly, salvation is entirely and utterly God's grace. You see, you and I uh, come into existence from this point of spiritual deadness. There's something that is much more than just our behavior, who we are on the outside, but there's something deep within us with which we are born, a, a glitch in the system, you could say, something that is in desperate need of salvation because of the fall. And, and therefore Paul writes, and he puts it like this, he says in verse 3, by nature, you and I were children of wrath. We were like the rest of mankind. Paul makes it so clear that there's but only one cure for this terminal condition that we find ourselves in. And that is to find ourselves in Jesus Christ. You see, no amount of humanitarian programs, no weight of, of good works and moral behavior, and no medical technology, nothing can slow down death in us and in mankind. Uh, there is decay at every level of our existence. You and I were born dead. And the only way for us to come alive is through the intervention of God. Fourth, the fourth marker we see about this, this but God aspect of the gospel is our position is now similar to that of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? In verse 6, Paul says, uh, He raised us up with Him and He seated us with Him in the heavenly places. This is such good news. Having started from this place of spiritual death where we had no hope. And then this aspect of but God coming in and God just changing things and making a relationship with him possible. This is such good news. And maybe you noticed uh, in your Bible, uh, in the portion that we read, that it's one long uninterrupted sentence. And in the original, in the Greek, it's the same. You'll find in this whole first chapter and portion of two, uh, it's one long sentence. And, and I think the reason for that is because Paul was just so excited about this wonderful news, this, this aspect where God comes and he intervenes that he wasn't able to find a full stop in that whole passage. It's almost like when, when your child has been away for a weekend to a friend on a farm and they did so many things, they, they, uh, they were fishing and they were playing in the dam and they and they did all sorts of things that were so wonderful and exciting and they want to tell you about it uh, they they almost don't have a place to catch their breath because they're so excited about this and that is what Paul is writing about he's so excited about this good news because you see you and I may have been born in sin but we were not created for sin in our first sermon we learned that God thought of us. He chose us in Him even before the foundation of the earth. And the thoughts that He had about you were good thoughts, prosperous thoughts, thoughts of, of, a, of a, a relationship of intimacy and harmony with Him. He did not create you to sin. And that's such good news. We see secondly uh, that we have been saved through grace. You see, the nature of salvation is the fact that you and I needed salvation. We needed to be rescued because we were in distress. Uh, we were beyond repair. In another place, Paul writes and he says, We were without hope and without God in this 
world. And it's so important for us to understand that you and I, before Jesus, were dead. We weren't just drowning. We were dead. We were in trouble. We needed recreation. We, need to be, we needed to be recreated, to be restored to the original design that God had for us. And so, so Jesus came and Jesus rescued us from sin and shame. He rescued us from slavery to, to sin and slavery to our flesh. He came and He restored to us uh, what originally was God's plan. We were dead. We were enslaved uh, to wicked powers. We were under God's wrath, like verse 3 tells us. But then we were made alive in Christ. We were given new life. God came and He restored us and He, he uh, transferred us to the realm of Jesus Christ, of His Son, and He seated us with Him in heavenly places. Isn't that wonderful? So we see that we are saved by grace. Grace is such a wonderful truth. What is grace? Grace is when you and I are treated exactly the opposite to what we deserve. It's like, it's like a murderer on death row and suddenly he's acquitted and he is set free. It, it is it is something ridiculous. You can't, you can't think that it's possible. But in Jesus Christ it is. And God comes and He treats us differently to what we actually deserved. And so verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And so the good news of the gospel is that God helps the helpless. Is this popular saying and it originated with the Greeks that God only helps those who help themselves. But this is totally opposed to the biblical truth of salvation. Because you see, God comes in the gospel and He helps the helpless. In Romans 5 or 6 we read, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. You and I were weak. We were unable to save ourselves. We were in such a dilemma. And then God came and He helped the helpless. We cannot be saved on the one hand by, by our terrible, wicked, so-called good works, but we can't be saved by doing good either. It's only by grace that we can be saved. God's unmerited favor when He comes and He works through His Holy Spirit in our hearts and He works salvation in our hearts. Although this is such a central truth, such an amazing, wonderful truth, the saving grace of God, there are many Christians who struggle with assurance of faith. Can I be sure of my salvation is a, a question that haunts so many Christians. And then it's wonderful to read in the Bible the truth about our salvation, how, how it's unchangeable, how it can't be taken away from us. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 10 from verse 8, The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart one believes and is justified, and with a mouth one confesses and is saved. For the Scripture says, everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. It's such a wonderful truth, and today I want to encourage you to take that to heart. Maybe you're sitting there at home and you, you're saying, well, I, I struggle with my assurance of faith. I am in Christ. I am a newborn child of God. I'm a disciple of Jesus. Well, take to heart today the truth of the word that says no one who puts his trust in Jesus will be ashamed. Everyone will be saved who finds themselves in Jesus Christ. So Paul is writing to these Ephesians and he knows that they are saved. He is certain that they are saved. This church is a church that serves Jesus. Some of them may be infants in Christ and others may have served Him for a longer time, but they all serve Him. And Paul comes to remind them of this wonderful fact that they are saved and that they will remain saved. Again, another portion that just drives this home is Hebrews 10 from verse 19. Verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. You can be assured 
of your salvation in Jesus Christ. You don't have to doubt it because you have been saved by grace. And thirdly, he says, through faith. You've been saved by grace through faith. Very important uh, is to take note of the preposition that is used here. We are not saved by faith. We are saved through faith. And the idea here is that faith is only a channel. Uh, faith is not the thing that saves me. Faith is merely the channel. It's not my faith that saves me. But faith, saving faith, is a gift from God that the Holy Spirit works in my heart. And then Paul says, uh, this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God. You see, even the fact that we come to faith is something that God works in our hearts. And therefore, saving faith and salvation is not something that we can take pride in. Uh, it's not earned by our own efforts. As Paul says in verse 9, he says, it's not a result of works that no one can boast. So wonderful today to know that, that every aspect of my life and of your life is thanked to God. Everything that we have, we have because of Him. We would not have anything apart from Him. And therefore, we can't boast in our own salvation. A fourth wonderful truth that we see here is the, the master craftsman at work. In verse 10, this climatic verse of our portion today, we see God's workmanship. He says, that for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Salvation is God's workmanship. God is the, the workman. He's the one who makes us alive. He's the one who raises us up with Him. He works faith in our hearts. Salvation is an act of creation. God is the great creator God. And when He created any, everything in the book uh, of Genesis, we see that God creates out of nothing. God creates without building material, without a blueprint, without anyone advising Him or give, uh, paying Him a favor or helping Him. It's His plan. It's His initiative. And so in recreation in Jesus Christ, God also comes and He recreates us a full, complete and a new work. You see, the salvation that God creates in us and recreates us is not uh, taking us from, from nice people to better people. It doesn't take us from, from people that are almost dead to people that are more alive. No, we were dead. We were darkness and He takes us into the, the light. He recreates us. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, Paul says, uh, but if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So lastly, we learn that having been saved by grace through faith, that you and I were recreated, not by good works, but for good works. It's beautiful to, to note in this portion that everything that Paul writes about the past of these Ephesians, everything that belonged to their past life, their, their life in the past, is written in the past tense because it's over, it is dealt with. But the aspects of their new life, of their recreation in Jesus Christ, all of that is written in the present continuous tense. And today, if you find yourself in Christ, having been recreated by Him, this is your reality. Everything good is in the present and everything that used to belong to your old self is in the past. It's done and over with. But it looks like Paul was reminding, again, was reminding these Ephesians of their place, their position in Jesus Christ. Eugene Peterson says that uh, this church seems to have uh, suffered from spiritual amnesia, uh, so to speak, and that Paul wanted to give them some GPS coordinates for their spiritual life. So four things that he does is, first of all, he uh, tells them where they came from. And we read this. We, we saw that he wrote that they were dead in their trespasses and sins. He writes about what happened to them, the, the fall of mankind. Uh, thirdly, he tells them what they've been given. They've been raised up with Christ. They've been seated in heavenly places. And then lastly, he tells them where they're going to, where they headed. They headed for this amazing future with God. Verse 7, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You see, when we are recreated in Jesus Christ, you and I have been given the glory of God, the presence of God inside us, and we're called to exhibit this beauty. 
the first Adam, was also called to this. And he was called to walk with God intimately and to, and to exhibit his glory everywhere he went. But then the fall happened and this picture, this purpose was damaged. And that's why the second Adam, Jesus Christ, came. And all of this was restored for us so that you and I can live out, can exhibit God's glory wherever we go. In Romans 5, we read that from verse 17, For if because of one man tre man's trespasses, because of Adam's trespasses, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You and I have received this wonderful calling that although we were born spiritually dead, God came and He intervened and God came and He saved us by grace through faith. And now He's given us His glory to carry within us so that we can exhibit it to the world. You see, God has a plan for you. He has a plan with your life. In Jesus Christ, you are recreated. God crafted, God designed wonderful, beautiful works for you to walk in. You did not obtain your salvation because of these works, but after being saved, God now has this purpose for you to walk in these wonderful works. There's a beautiful scripture in Acts 13 verse 36 that, that tells of how David pursued this life that he had with God, how David fulfilled the good works that God had prepared for him. It says there, for David, after he had served the purposes of God in his own generation, fell asleep. You see, David saw something of what God had called him to. And you and I are called to this. These wonderful, beautiful, good works. Things that God has designed and prepared for us so that we may walk in them as long as we live. But we don't do these good works in order to be recreated. No, that happens in Jesus Christ. You and I cannot be self-made men of faith. You and I can't make it happen it doesn't uh, only happen merely by turning over a new leaf. No, it happens through the resurrection life of Jesus Christ in us. Maybe today you are asking, how do I know the plan of God for my life? How can I know what God has planned for me? These good works that you are talking about, how do I discover these works? Well, it starts off by surrendering. To him. It starts off by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, by finding yourself in Him, by acknowledging that you are spiritually dead without Him and that you need to be recreated by Jesus Christ. Secondly, it's important to pursue Him, to chase after God, to seek Him every day. We have been found in Christ and now the invitation is that daily we walk with Him. And we, that we function among a recreated people, our church, the community of believers that you are part of. Because that is where we grow and that is also where we discover the gifts that God has given us. These gifts He's given us will correspond to the way that He made you. And then finally, we need to walk in the good works that God has prepared for us. But it all starts with surrender. Maybe today you are watching this and saying that I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I know that I'm spiritually dead. I haven't experienced this, this moment, this but God moment for my life. And I want to surrender myself to Him. I want to pray for you. Maybe today you're saying that you know Him. You are a child of God. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. But you need to discover these good works that God has created for you. You need to go and walk into that. Why don't you do that from today? I want to pray for you. Thank you, Father, that we can discover in this wonderful book that although we are born spiritually dead, although, Lord, we walked in uh, the sin and the trespasses, which actually just proved that we were dead, that in you we are recreated and we are part of a recreated people. I pray for everyone this morning, Lord, that says that, that they want to commit their lives to you, that they want to find themselves in you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you do this wonderful work in us, that we are saved by grace through faith. I pray for all of us, Lord, that we would discover and keep on discovering these wonderful good works that you've prepared for us, Lord, that we may walk in them and through that exhibit your glory to the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. 
Amen.